his carriage came. Isn't that something? And the folks who saw it knew the sleepy days were through. The years ahead would never be the same. Yeah, the Gee. folks who what saw it knew. Those sleepy days were true. Wow. The years ahead would never be the same. That sure is something. But there was more, another change in store. A miracle to put the past to shame. For soon the electric light would brighten up the night. The years ahead would never be the same. The years ahead would never be the same. Yes, there were miracles of plenty in those days, and they were miracles. For better or worse, the lady of the house became a housewife. The machine age was on us, and with it, the brand new problem of quantity production. Making products in large enough numbers to supply a huge market. America needed the raw materials to mass produce its future. The answer was here, as it always had been, in the richness of the earth. Here were the metals that industry needed. They had to be mined and smelted and refined, but in a better, more efficient way. And on a scale to meet the challenge of the 20th century. It was a sleepy time till 1899 And the years ahead would never be the same The years ahead would never be the same That's the name. We'll call it American Smelting and Refining Company. And with it we will organize the principal lead and silver smelting works in the United States to build a stronger smelting industry. Don't you think you're biting off more than you can chew? Mr. Rogers, in these days, only the well-financed can survive. But it's a big job putting anything this size together. How do we know we can make it work? We have no choice. We have to grow with the country. Just think of the lead they'll need for electric cables. And I heard that Ransom Olds is building a motor car plant in Detroit next year. And that could be a big outlet for us. Our new venture will strengthen the industry and it will strengthen us. Eleven companies were included to form Asarco. But within a year, they were on the rocks. Enter the men who saved them, Daniel Guggenheim and his brothers. The Guggenheims were no strangers to the metal business. Twenty years earlier, their father, Meyer Guggenheim, had invested in two lead and silver mines in Colorado. On the western side of the Great Divide, where the trees grow tall and skinny, on the western side of the Great Divide, where the trees grow tall and skinny, Meyer Guggenheim got himself two mines, the A.Y. and the Mini. The A.Y. and the Mini. They were flooded out and there weren't much doubt, their silver days were over. They were flooded out and there weren't much doubt, their silver days were over. But Meyer said he would go ahead and soon he'd be in clover. Well, he got himself a good engineer, and they unflooded the mine. But the water came back, so they had to start all over again. But Meyer said, keep at it, boys, I'll back you to the limit. Keep at it, boys, keep at it, boys, I'll back you to the limit. Keep at it, boys, keep at it, boys, I'll back you to the limit. And then one day, Meyer got a telegram from the mine superintendent. Struck rich ore in A.Y. shaft number one. You have a bonanza. <laughs> There's no ifs or buts. It takes a lot of guts if you want to get into mining. There's no ifs or buts. It takes a lot of guts if you want to get into mining. Gotta hang on tight. Part your hair just right to find that silver lining. Gotta hang on tight. Part your hair just right to find that silver lining. Today, Asarco's Leadville plant is recovering metal values from waste dumps at the old AY and mini mines. By 1901, Meyer Guggenheim's sons had three mines, four smelters, and a refinery. 
These holdings, plus new capital and the properties of the original Rogers venture, all came together to form the new Asarco, ready for the challenge of the time. And the times were moving fast. In 1902, there were two million telephones in the United States. Uh, more or less. For Asarco, that year meant a new lead plant near Salt Lake City. The Wright brothers make history and realize one of the ancient dreams of man, flight. A sirloin steak cost 24 cents. In 1906, automobiles are in the news again. Sarko continues expanding to meet the needs of a growing nation. A drop in the bucket meant something else to a miner. Motor cars are selling like crazy. People ate in them, slept in them, even got married in them. In 1908, Hollywood quickened the pace of American life, and kissing took on a whole new style. In 1920, every other car in the world was a Ford Model T. The building boom was on. For Asarco, this meant a new zinc plant in Amarillo, Texas. From progress and prosperity to near starvation, the Depression brought us up sharply, like a kick in the pants. And the dreams of a madman led the world into war. It demanded greater efforts from the people of Asarco. Our Corpus Christi zinc plant was completed just in time to aid in the struggle for freedom. The technological revolution after the war meant new applications for the products of Asarco. Plants like our lead smelter in Glover, Missouri provided the material for man to make miracles. The miracles keep coming, but the metals and minerals that make it all possible still must come from the earth. Ilmenite, coal, bismuth, cadmium, selenium, gold, tellurium, lead, copper, Zinc, silver. These are the products of Asarco today. 24 metals and minerals. But the first thing is you gotta find them. a lad they said to me gold is where you find it so I looked real hard at every rock and twice as hard behind it never found a blasted thing but now I can tell where the ore is found if only you will listen like pie in the sky or the rainbow's end it's right there where it isn't <laughs> they used to call it prospecting now it's exploration Science has taken over. Here's one way we look for ore, a special helicopter with electromagnetic detectors built into it. It's interesting work, but it's still a long, tough job. And it's a challenge. We don't find ore every day or even every year, but we make a good strike every once in a while. It's a big business exploration. At Asarco, we have about 90 geologists, plus a technical staff to back them up and field offices around the world. It's a massive effort. Roger, stand by. I'm ready. 
We look for ore in a lot of different ways. For one thing, we take samples of silt and soil and streams, because if there's ore around, tiny amounts of the metals can actually show up in the sediments. The company's geochemical laboratory analyzes our samples with all kinds of tests. Here's a place in Arizona, copper country. This whole area has been heavily explored for years by a lot of companies, but we spotted an outcrop you could actually see from the road. No ore in the outcrop. But some good hard geologic deduction told us there ought to be ore in the ground. There was. You find it, and then you've got to get it out. You're down here, maybe 3,000 or 4,000 feet, and it's like another world. I guess we just sort of take it for granted, but most people never see this site in their whole lives. For a lot of us, mining runs in the family. My father was a miner for a Sarko. I have a brother and a brother-in-law. They're miners too. This is Galena, out in Idaho, second biggest silver mine in the United States. The ore has copper in it too. Where there's silver, there's often some copper, and vice versa. This is the Mission Copper Mine in Arizona. Open pit mining is different. The problem is moving vast amounts of ore and rock. There's a long gap between discovery and production. Sackerton went into production in 74. When it comes to equipment, we don't fool around. Take one of these loaders, nine cubic yards of ore in one bucketful. Those tires are eight feet high. A good shovel runner can load 125 to 140 trucks during his shift. Here at the Mission Mine in Arizona, we have processed as much as 36 million tons of ore and waste in one year. The reason for all this tonnage is the low copper content of the ore. Out of this 85-ton truckload, for example, will come only a half ton of copper. Near Lakehurst, New Jersey, in 1957, we discovered ilmenite gives us titanium dioxide for use in paints. Conservationists make much of the fact that mines tear up the land. The fact is that if you took all the mines and plants that have produced all the mining materials in the United States since 1776, the total land area disturbed has been less than 0.3%. And one third of that has already been reclaimed by man or healed by nature. Asarco beautifies or reclaims mining land whenever possible. Asarco owns or has an important interest in 38 different mining properties in the United States and in many other countries. You're in British Columbia. In the winter, as much as 80 feet of snow can fall here in one season. The Grand Duke Copper Mine, 50% owned by Asarco, is a triumph of man over nature. 11,000 feet up in Leadville, Colorado, Asarco mines lead, zinc, and silver. This is the Silver Bell Mine in Arizona. The copper from this mine is processed in the concentrator nearby. Sarco has been in Mexico since the company was founded in 1899, 
first with smelters and then with silver lead mines. The names are music. Tepizela, Sierra Mojada, Santa Eulalia, Chihuahua, Aguas Calientes, Monterey. Some of the mines are gone now, but others have taken their place. Santa Barbara, Taxco, Inguaran. Now these operations are majority owned by Mexican capital and run by Mexican management. Toquepala, Peru, where Southern Peru Copper Corporation, 51.5% owned by Asarco, mines copper high in the Andes. Nearby, the Cuajone project is being developed. You're in Australia now, the Mount Isa mine. In 1930, Asarco's participation with new capital saved Mount Isa from going under. Today, it employs more than 7,000 people. It is managed entirely by Australians, and there is widespread Australian ownership. Mount Isa helps make Australia one of the world's principal producers of copper, zinc, silver, and lead. At Black Lake in Quebec, Canada, Asarco mines asbestos. And serving all the metal mines, 22 smelters and refineries. Turning ore into usable metal was the first activity of Asarco in 1899, and it remains a vital part of the company's business. This country has grown, and Asarco has grown with it. In the 75 years between 1899 and 1974, Asarco's U.S. refineries alone produced 26 million tons of refined copper, 26 million tons of lead, 6 million tons of zinc, and 6 billion ounces of silver. That has been the challenge in the earth. But today, at many Asarco plants, something else has been added. These unusual structures have nothing to do with smelting and refining themselves. These are sulfur recovery plants installed at Tacoma, Hayden, and El Paso to absorb much of the sulfur dioxide released by those copper smelters. The gas is transformed into sulfuric acid, or liquid sulfur dioxide, for use by industry. It's part of Asarco's continuing program of environmental control. Of course, when it comes to pollution, few people realize that nature itself is one of the worst offenders. More sulfur was put into the atmosphere by three volcanic eruptions in this century than has ever been put there by all of industry since the beginning of time.
not all of Osarco's metal comes from mines. The Federated Metal Division treats non-ferrous scrap collected from all over the country. The recycling of metals, by the way, is a big help in reducing this country's waste disposal problem. Making ore into usable metal. It sounds simple, but behind the processes lie a lot of complicated chemistry and physics and metallurgy. And plenty of problems to solve. Most of the problems usually end up here, at Osarco's Central Research Laboratory. In metal research, you never know what the next day will bring. Sometimes we're analyzing copper samples, or we're testing the physical properties of all types of metals, or trying to improve a process or whatever. Through its research, Asarco invented the continuous casting process for copper. A major metallurgical advancement. Another result of metal research has been the vertical shaft furnace, one of the most outstanding developments in the last 25 years. Of course, there is another angle to research, and that's the mineral side, where we help the mines and exploration. And so, day after day, research goes on, always looking for better ways, better ideas. Here's something kind of different, an electric car. We help design it. You know how much it costs to drive it all the way across the country? About 35 bucks. We figure that's not just anti-pollution, that's anti-inflation. Asarco products touch the lives of everyone in America. This is the Jackson family on a typical Saturday afternoon. Maybe not so typical. Dad has actually got Junior to wash the car. Let's play a little game. Can you guess how many objects in this car contain Asarco products in some shape or form? There's zinc in the grill. Zinc oxide in the tires. There's zinc in the carburetor, in the handles and the trim, in the dashboard and the windshield wipers. There's asbestos in the undercoat and brake linings. There's copper in the car wiring, the generator and the radiator. Lead and zinc oxide in the paint. Lead in the batteries. Of course, not everything beautiful is made out of a Sarko product. Oh yeah, mom's camera has silver on the film, cadmium in the flash, selenium in the photoelectric cell. <gasps> Now let's play another game. Suppose these uh, gentlemen remove some of the objects from the house that are made with or contain a Sarko products. Well, there goes the gold tray and the brass fireplace set and the silver tea set. Now they're taking the copper lamp, the bronze ash tray, even dad's last beer. Solder in the can, you know. your kitchen. Oh yeah, from the kitchen, the toaster, the coffee pot, and the blender. They even tore the walls apart to get at the copper wiring and plumbing before they left. Of course, we've said nothing so far about silver-plated bearings in modern aircraft or lead shielding in atomic submarines. or supplying so many essential metals for the United States space program, or the new thermoelectric pacemaker for damaged hearts. It uses bismuth and tellurium, or lead protection against x-rays. The list is endless. There isn't a single major industry which doesn't use the materials we produce. We were standing
standing on the hill looking at the sky and thinking about spacecraft and pictures from the moon and all those amazing things. She had her head on my shoulder. She was looking a long way off. And then very softly, she said, I wonder where the world is headed. How far can we possibly go? How far to the farthest star? How far to a dream? How tall is the mind of man? How grand is the scheme? How far to a miracle? By far the repair. How far do you want to go? How much will you dare? How long can a journey take? It's hard to predict the future. In 1947, the statisticians predicted that the United States would use up its supply of most metals before 1972. Today, mineral reserves are being mined that weren't even dreamed of 25 years ago. Sarko is constantly searching for new fields and is just as constantly expanding with major construction underway around the world. It takes a lot of work and a lot of good, hard-working people, as it always will. But isn't that the story of the world? Oh, the world keeps rolling on, rolling on, rolling on. Yes, the world keeps rolling on, rolling on. This old world keeps rolling on, and a man does what he can, does his part to keep it spinning good and strong. Puts a handle in the earth, and he turns for all he's worth, and the world keeps on rolling, rolling on. pilot to the state of Washington. And there can't be any doubt what the whole thing's all about. This whole world will keep a rolling, rolling on. There's a giant in the ground. He can work the world around. He can give us miracles from dawn to dawn. Then chill up from down below. Ahead would never be the same. The years ahead would never be the same.